patients are satisfied with doctors when they see them as humane individuals who have an interest in their psychosocial world, who are technically competent and provide um, proper knowledge. Uh, but more important than that, they need to feel comfortable and trusting with the doctor. Patients are putting themselves in a very vulnerable state with doctors, and uh, that, that is a sense of trust that has to be reciprocated. and he could speak into your life and see things that other people couldn't see for themselves. So he really helped a lot of people. I used to joke around and tell people that he was my personal therapist. He always said he was going to live to be over a hundred. And I would say, how do you know? And he would say, I just know. He just worked really hard and maybe breathed in some plant stuff and where we were taking care of it at home. And a few weeks went by and it was getting worse, not better. He was constantly saying, I, it's, I can feel where it's stuck, I just can't get to it. We did nasal rinses and all sort of, sorts of things. So he would point here and here. And as it got worse, he was unable to lie down flat and breathe at the same time. In October he went to see an urgent care visit at a local hospital. Um, so they went ahead and prescribed him some medication, gave him two shots. We went home and then he began to react to the medication. So now he was in pain and was having struggles that he didn't have and so we began a very fast and furious three-week journey of seeing a few different doctors in two different um, urgent care and two completely different ERs and then a third hospital ER which ended up being a hospital stay. And so we started to question our own questioning of the medication and what we could see happening in those cycles and wonder if he had cancer. Well, in that observation unit, there were five doctors who came in, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer. One believed he had cancer. Guess who was put in charge of Mike's care? The one who believed that he had cancer. And that's when, instead of backing off on the drugs, the drugs increased. who were really teaching the art of medicine, how to listen actively, how to negotiate treatments, uh, the whole concept of patient-centered care. It was in 2001 that the Institute of Medicine came up with the concept of patient-centered care, which means that patients have to be involved in the decision-making and need to be fully informed. Uh, but these days, uh, especially with reduced reimbursements, as I mentioned before, Doctors are feeling under pressure to make more money. And the two ways they can make more money is to see patients in less time and to do more procedures instead of seeing the patients. So I think in modern times we have an uphill battle. to shrink and I thought this I, I know I'm seeing this but I feel like we must be crazy but I know I'm seeing this when the medication would start to wear off his muscles would start to plump back a little bit and we would point that out to the doctors and it just didn't really didn't really help the doctor who was put in charge of Mike's care in the ICU 
finally through an MRI one night and guess what they checked from here up and she came to me and said Mike has two hidden mucus pockets and I said let me guess they're here and here and she hung her head and she said yes So I'm elated, I'm jumping up and down. I ran into his room and I told the nurse. The nurse ended up requesting to be able to do a deep suction. She said, I'm really good at this. And she went in there with a very simple procedure. She went in and she was able to suction out those two areas and he was able to cough up and um, he could breathe. That particular doctor wanted Mike to be on a detoxification plan until Tuesday and another doctor was in charge and he agreed with the guys on the cancer train they, that the top oncologist did not believe he had cancer but this doctor and a few others still kept pushing the medications. One doctor is saying one thing and another doctor is saying another thing, then uh, there needs to be better communication and that could be done in many levels. One by the patient asserting it, the second be the, the patient asserting it to the doctor who seems to be more communicative. Uh, can you talk with so and so and come to a consensus or a reconciliation? The doctor who believed Mike had cancer was pushing for some um, very aggressive tests to be done on his extremely weak body. And so they did um, neurological tests where they put pins in all of his muscles deep into his tissues. And then immediately following that, they asked to do a spinal tap. And I actually said, can't you wait until tomorrow when he's already scheduled to have a lymph node taken out so that you can actually see if he has cancer. And they said, no, we need to do it now. I regret signing the paper because I, we did approve it, but everything inside of me said, don't sign this paper. But they really stood their ground that he needed this spinal tap so we let them do it. And in patient-centered care, the doctor has to be sure that the patient not only understands what's being said, but has an ability to voice their understanding and their schema or their expectations of what should be done in the care. So it's a two-way street. So I think the doctor has to do things like, if they're providing information saying, tell me what you just heard, how much do you understand? Do you have any questions? And if the patient doesn't agree, well, the doctor shouldn't shove it down their throat. The doctor has to say, well, here are some other options. The doctor has to be seen as the provider of information, a coach, a partner, but not a director. Two doctors in the hall said to me, your husband really does reject drugs like no one we've ever seen. We had to give him enough Dilaudid to sedate a rhino. Any normal man would not survive. Your husband has the liver of a horse. From that point on, Mike didn't come out of that drug reaction. All these machines were beeping and everything, and the doctor sent us all out of the room really fast, and, and they began to work on Mike. Alarms went off. And all these strong men, any, any strong man working on the staff in that floor at that moment was lined up in a line. And one at a time, they're doing the counts and they're doing the chest compressions. They would take turns and then wait, clear, and then they would do it again. And we watched a few rounds of this. And then the doctor, he came out and he was standing to my left and he was saying, I have to call it. I have to call it. They worked on him 20 minutes. He's standing there and he says, we have to call it. And I just didn't say anything at all. And then he said, um, time of death, 5 
So one of the things that I would love to see happen for change, I would love, I would have loved to have had real time view of what was going into Mike's medical records. Because as his advocate, I would have read every single note that was going in as it was going in so that we were all on the same page with communication. I don't hate these doctors or nurses. I hate what happened to Mike. I hated walking through it. I thought we would come out of it and go home, but we didn't. I know these doctors, several of them were kind. They were on Mike Schroyer's side. They wanted him to live. They were fighting for him. They were good people. I think the system is broken. I think our communication was broken. And there are a lot of things that could be changed for the good. The chief medical officer um, didn't want to hear my ideas for change unless I could admit publicly that I believed that Mike received the highest level standard of care, the highest quality standard of care. I had said to them, I'm here to build a bridge, not a case. When Mike would counsel people, he would say, build bridges, not cases. It's a big deal for me. It was like a big moment. It's a, I feel like a grown up now. It's awesome. <laughs> 